Cyberpunk 2077 should be the event that finally prohibits everyone from getting excited over the release of a video game. People actually plan their vacations around this game. When it was delayed, then delayed again, then delayed one more time, people lost their minds and sent death threats to the developer for ruining their weekend. Now the game is finally in their hands, and still ruining their weekend in what must be gaming's greatest sunk cost fallacy. I can only pity the people who have been sitting on their couch for the last few days of their wasted vacation, becoming ever more aware of the growing line graph drawn in their mind of reality versus expectations, occasionally noticing in the corners of their eyes their dusty copies of No Man's Sky and Fallout 76. CD Projekt Red is a victim of their own past competence in this case. After all, their last game was Witcher 3, an enormously successful fantasy role-playing game based off a beloved work of fiction that put them on everyone's radar. So it stands to reason that their follow-up being a cyberpunk role-playing game should follow the same course. The thing is, everyone forgot about that number 3 in The Witcher 3, though that's not exactly their fault. CDPR did try to hide that numeral as best they could in the box art. There was a Witcher 1 and 2 before it, and Cyberpunk 2077 reminds me a great deal of the first two Witcher games. Labor Glorious inventory management, poorly explained game mechanics, and Eurojank leaking out of every orifice, but all tempered by the fact that there is a well-written plot under the stress-damaged surface if your masochistic tendencies kick in to enjoy it. At best, Cyberpunk 2077 is a pile of Lego bricks CD Projekt Red poured all over the floor. You can have fun with it, but you are going to step on a piece now and then. If you bought this game at launch, your best move would be to stuff it in a desk drawer and set a notification for six months from now when the game has been patched a few times. Or just wait until Cyberpunk 3. That game is guaranteed to blow your fucking mind. In Cyberpunk 2077, you get to customize your genitals. I appreciate that option, but I would have appreciated a reason for it even more. You can only admire your large penis, and let's be frank, you chose a large penis in the inventory screen if you take your pants off. At least let my romantic partners remark on it. You also get to choose a character background that determines which of the three scenarios you start the game on. Street Kid, Nomad, and Corpo. Your backstory only has slightly higher relevance than your choice of genital size. All three serve the same purpose of having V meet and befriend Jackie before becoming a mercenary in Night City after a job goes wrong. I played the Nomad option, but all expectations of my chosen background would affect choices in the game largely fell flat. At best, you get a few extra dialogue options that doesn't steer the missions in a new direction. Nice effort, no value. V went from wearing no Nomad jacket while looking in the mirror, to wearing one so he could tear a patch off it with no more than a glance downward and back up at the mirror. Really setting the quality standards high from the first few seconds, aren't we? You said it was nothing serious when I came in. You said you were sure. If V can fix his own car so easily without tools or help from the mechanic, why bother bringing it to a garage in the first place? All of the nomads depicted in the game, including V, are extremely competent with keeping their cars running since their life depends on them. I suppose now is as good a time as any for going over the police in this game, since they will never be an issue ever again. This game features the laziest implementation of police in an open world game that I've ever encountered. In all previous open world games, cops would spawn down the street from the player, drive up in a vehicle, then get out before trying to apprehend or kill you, giving the player time to know where the police are coming from so they can respond. Here, if you cause a commotion on the streets, cops will immediately spawn behind you, even in areas they couldn't possibly reach. And they fail to give chase if you get in a car to run away. It's such a simple mechanic that I didn't think you could possibly get it wrong. But the most hyped open world game for the past 8 years completely flubbed it. V and Jackie were hired to smuggle contraband into Night City. Jackie is from Night City and came out to the Badlands with his own vehicle and collected the package, then waited around in a trailer for V to show up. And V's job seems to be simply driving Jackie back across the border with a package, which means V is completely unnecessary for a job like this and Jackie could have done it on his own. Cyberpunk is easily my favorite genre of science fiction. Neuromancer, Snow Crash, Blade Runner, Deus Ex, and hell, let's even throw in Ghost of the Shell, have influenced my own taste in entertainment more than anything else. There's a common thread running through all the best cyberpunk fiction and it's that they were all written during the 80s and 90s. Cyberpunk wasn't trying to predict the future of technology like so many other sci-fi genres. It's at its best when it's a reflection of modern society and culture with technology only empowering the worst aspects of it. And for a game that has laid claim to the very genre name, Cyberpunk 2077 gets the retro 80s futurism visuals down pretty well. But I never shook the feeling that I was standing on the back lot that filmed Blade Runner on only during the daytime. It all feels a bit shallow. Deus Ex is 20 years old now and was a better representation of modern cyberpunk. Since it ditched trying to recreate the retro futurism of the 80s, and tried to adapt the issues people faced at the time it was made. I can understand how that world functions, which is pretty key to immersing yourself in a cyberpunk story. This sin video might end up turning into a guide of how to actually enjoy Cyberpunk 2077 by the time I wrap it up. The best advice I can give you is to ignore most of the game's mechanics, and especially ignore the economy system. That is unless your cyberpunk fantasy included searching rooms like you came with a warrant for every speck of collectible junk you can sell or break down into spare parts for crafting. But you should also ignore crafting as well and sell the components for even more money than the complete product would have sold for. I'm beginning to see why America's economy collapsed in this world's lore. There's so much tedium you'll have to wade through that half your playtime will be spent inside 
outside inventory screens. I don't play RPGs or roleplay as a recyclable can collector. And while I am on the topic, you can safely ignore the character stat sheet. My build was unoptimized as hell, and the game was still piss easy. I couldn't go 5 feet without tripping over someone's inhaler that instantly fixes bullet holes. I think I had hundreds of the things in stock by the end. There's a good reason most games set a hard cap on restorative items. I can't show you even a censored image of even a single frame of it due to YouTube being the world's most sexually repressed librarian, but Cyberpunk 2077's boob rendering tech is probably the only real contender to Metro Last Lights. Granted, I didn't get to play this game in max settings due to scalpers hoarding all the RTX 3080s like they were the cure for their embarrassing erectile dysfunction and delusion that they're entrepreneurs, but it seems only Eastern European game devs care about this subject to put enough work hours into it. Maybe that explains the delays. V doesn't know how to use a bed. Seeing as every time he goes to sleep in his apartment, he crawls halfway onto it and lays in the wrong direction while leaving his lower half uncomfortably lying on the floor. Oh, V! You get any sleep? I'm interested in how these video calls work. Neither Jackie nor V carry cell phones. Instead, using neural implants let them call and speak to each other just by thinking about it. So where is the external camera streaming their face to the other when the phone is inside their gray matter? I had a good laugh watching people with cybernetic arms working out in a gym. I'm just wondering why they're wasting their time trying to earn gains on cyborg arms. This is ironically one of the best people watching Sims out of all open world games, since none of the NPC reactions ever work properly. Shoot a gun and people will cower endlessly in fear on their knees, while drivers can't seem to figure out how to drive around or over the soda can you can casually toss in the street. Similar to how the original cut of Blade Runner was a goddamn mess and made the movie hard to watch until it was eventually re-released as it should have been, Cyberpunk 2077 is a game you should probably put off until the director's cut. For a while, the bugs I encountered, like Jackie eating with multiple chopsticks while telling V about their new job, were sort of entertaining. But after a while, you stop laughing at the NPCs randomly performing positions 52 through 71 from the Karma Sutra. Even though none of the bugs were game-breaking, they did start to annoy the piss out of me, especially when subtitles would constantly get stuck on screen, forcing me to reload my save to fix it. Over the course of the week, I I played it, I encountered fewer and fewer bugs due to patches. So I'm sure at some point down the line, all the holes will be polished out, and the fanboys will expect everyone to never mention the sorry state the game shipped in because it's better now. I hear No Man's Sky is a pretty good game these days after all the patches, but you still won't find many singing its praises. Do you truly believe that those who have sold you your mechanical eyes have resisted the temptation to peek through them? It's never a good sign when you run into Twitch streamers who have been dropped into the game. I ran across three of them during my playtime and one of them featured a play on the streamer's last name being Cox, so of course he had a malfunctioning cyber penis. Hey V. Dr. Vector will see you now. If you think Misty being an obvious reference to Blade Runner is going too far, you haven't seen just how embarrassingly low this game will go to reference every popular cyberpunk work of fiction in existence. Sticking dead ringers for famous movie characters who then later offer V red and blue pills enters the eye roll zone that is usually reserved for situations involving aggressive horseflies. I ran into GLaDOS from Portal driving a taxi in one particularly cringe moment in the game. Was having Keanu Reeves, the star of The Matrix, and to a lesser extent Johnny Mnemonic not enough? There's a difference between showing your work and annoying everyone with it. The cybernetic upgrades in the game were another mechanic I felt disappointed with. The vast majority of them are just stat increases, with only double jumping legs and weaponized arms giving you something new to play with besides standard bullet time and extra healing. But I never found even those upgrades particularly useful. I picked Mantis hands because who wouldn't want to replace their weak monkey paws with Apex Predator metal claws? And then I hardly ever used them, because melee in the game is even more jank than the shooting. And oftentimes they would get me killed as V would be locked in a glory kill animation, sometimes with an invisible enemy I was apparently killing, or maybe he was just trying to intimidate the remaining survivors with what I had planned for them. I know it's a bug, but there is something oddly terrifying about a scene where a doctor injects me with an anesthetic, then turns my cyber eyes off, after which I see through the new eye he's installing that my pants are missing as well as my large size penis. You might feel a little discomfort at first. Blurred vision, low contrast, glitches. If only this warning had been found on the back of the game's case. After visiting Victor, V was supposed to talk to Jackie again, except he failed to load in, and I had to reload a save and go through the entire Ripper Doc scene again. And then the subtitle glitch forced me to reload again to get rid of it. Normally I would roll all the bugs I might encounter in a game into one sin, but my game was so defined by bugs I plan to mention quite a few of them. Your first mission for the Fixer Dex is easily the best mission in the game, and represents what I think Cyberpunk 2077 could have been. It features several branching paths, meaning your choices actually matter and events can play out wildly differently. The rest of the game features almost no choice in how you go about completing your objectives until the end of the game when you choose how to approach the final mission. Now answer my questions. Honestly. Forthrightly. Are you here alone? Meredith Stout is voiced by Erica Lindbeck, who also voices Misty, who we just met. Casting one person to play multiple roles in a game isn't unheard of, but casting one woman to play the first two major female characters you interact with takes you out of the experience, since I keep hearing the same voice with the only difference being one is more high-strung than the other. You have a plan how to deal with them? Could just take it by force, but they're expecting payment, so I could go that route too. 
Fine, the latter. But on one condition. You pay with our money. Meredith keeps a cred chip with a specifically tailored virus on it for just such an occasion. She also didn't bother asking for the amount, which is 10,000 eddies, which just happens to be the exact amount on her cred chip as well. You can crack encryption on shards given to you or found in the game. Supposedly, because this is the only time I ever did it. There might have been a few other instances of this I missed, but it's an underused mechanic that is poorly explained and I forgot all about it until I rewatched my footage to write lines for this video. Creds on this. People are going to extreme lengths to get their hands on a PlayStation 5 these days, aren't they? Did you ever play Bioshock Infinite? The gunplay in this reminds me a lot of that game. The game also introduces enemy netrunners who will hack you during combat and cause V to overheat. It took me a while to figure out what was even happening when this occurred, since the game never explained that enemies could do that, and I'm still not even sure how they do it, since most of the time when I was being hacked it was when no one had line of sight on me. It all combines into a messy flow of combat. It honestly feels like this was meant to play as a third person cover shooter. Here's me putting Dum Dum into an invisible headlock, to which he then escapes from by playing dead on the floor, causing Jackie to endlessly shoot him until I reload my save. They should have included a perk that activates a laugh track, because a good number of times I felt like I was in a comedy. Evelyn Parker is a person who hired Dex to set up the heist on Arasaka's relic, a personality transfer chip. Stealing from Arasaka is one of the most dangerous missions you could take in this world. Yet Dex, who should have a lot of contacts and more experienced mercs he could have worked with, picks Jackie and V, two rookies for this job. I'm not going to show you any animated footage of this scene, which is a far better courtesy than CD Projekt Red initially showed. I do like the irony of a cyberpunk game hacking the visual cortex of its players to fry their brains though. Before diving into Evelyn's BD of her time in Yorinobu's suite, Judy puts V through a brain dance of a store robber where a purpose shot and killed, letting V experience firsthand what it's like to die. On its own, this is an okay scene, but it actually has more weight later on when a very similar event happens to V after the Arasaka job goes down. It's very subtle storytelling that I'm guessing most didn't catch since the game was confident enough to not bring it up again, which is the kind of storytelling I always wish to see more of in games. BD implants pick up things that even the person wearing it doesn't, such as background noise that can be filtered out in infrared heat sources. That's all believable enough, but it also hacks into nearby security feeds while you're walking around and pulls the camera footage. Since V can scan a computer inside the brain dance and see through the camera that the perp's own partner shot him to create a flatline brain dance that sells for more money, and they use this feature to scope out the security in Yuri Nobo's pad. Do this job for me. I mean me alone. No splitting the payout with anyone else. No middlemen. No decks. Evelyn only just met V and knows nothing about him or where his loyalties lie, and she's asking him to screw over Dex by cutting him out of the deal after they steal the relic. Why would an AI-controlled taxi have a steering wheel? The next bit is focused on steering the flathead through the ventilation ducts to deal with the hotel security so V and Jackie can steal the relic from Yuri Nobu's penthouse. I always expected I'd end up comparing Cyberpunk 2077 to Watch Dogs Legion. I just never expected I would be comparing Cyberpunk 2077 ill-favorably to Watch Dogs Legion. At least that game had a spider bot you could directly control instead of clicking on waypoints to tell it where to go while you you watch through security cameras. Yorinobu's father, Soboro Arasaka, shows up in the middle of the heist to confront his son over his theft of the relic. Yorinobu planned to sell the chip to Netwatch, which is the same group Evelyn was also in talks with to sell the chip to. Netwatch really screwed themselves by encouraging Evelyn to steal the chip from Yorinobu who was already going to sell it to them. I wish to put the hotel on lockdown. May I ask why? Saburo Arasaka has been murdered. Code Red initiated. Bastard self-reported, and with the type of cover story a rookie player would come up with. What with the blood stain on the giant screen in the back of Saburo's head, the bruising that would be visible on his neck, and the lack of any poison that would be found in Saburo's body during an autopsy, or in any of the drinks on the table. Not to mention Yorinobu's strained history with his father as motive. Yorinobu, Saburo's bodyguard Takimura, and Adam Smasher leave the room in Saburo's body. Saburo was only the most powerful person in the world. Why would they all just leave the scene of the crime? Jackie, you're bleeding! Worry about me later. In a world where you can carry inhalers that heal wounds, Jackie not using one after taking a nasty fall makes his death feel lazy. Jackie and V had to leave their guns in the car before entering the hotel. V found Yorinobu's gun in his suite, but where did Jackie get his dual pistols back from? Jackie's death would have had a lot more impact had CD Projekt Red not explicitly spoiled this moment in a CG trailer for the game a year ago. You got any notion of the shit you pulled me into? You off the fucking Emperor! His Majesty! Anyone with so much as a pinky toe dipped in this mess is as good as dead!
For all of Dex's panic over Arasaka coming for them, the world's most evil and powerful corporation is pretty lazy when it comes to vendettas. V spends pretty much the entire game free to do as he likes without Arasaka coming after him. Even this moment where Dex turns on V and puts a bullet in his head was spoiled by a trailer. The only thing the game didn't end up including from that trailer is a scene where Johnny appears and tells V they have a city to burn. It's not hard to see why Keanu Reeves took the role of Johnny Silverhand. He's a badass, hard-drinking, anti-corporate Che Guevara rock star that sleeps with any woman he desires, otherwise known as Zag de la Rocha of Rage Against the Machine. Johnny's band Samurai is on stage singing Chippin' In, but the band is singing it before Johnny even arrived on stage for the vocals. Where was Johnny keeping that guitar? Jeez. Who wrote this manifesto? Erica Lindbeck also voices Spider in this game, and her character is surprisingly similar to her character Jesse from Final Fantasy VII Remake. Hell, this mission might as well be the bombing run mission from Final Fantasy VII. Saburo Arasaka was ancient back in 2023, and would be over 150 years old when his son killed him in 2077. And unless he had his children at age 100, I'm assuming his son and daughter are much older than they look as well. If people can seemingly live indefinitely through anti-aging technology, why would Saburo bother developing the relic which allows one to transfer their consciousness to a new body to escape dying? After shooting V in the head and tossing his body in the dump, Dex was located and forced to show one of Arasaka's ninjas, Takimura, where he dumped V's body. After which, Takimura kills Dex and tries to bring V back to Yorinobu Arasaka. But on the drive there, Yorinobu turns on Takimura and sends assassins to kill the both of them. If Yorinobu wants V dead that badly, he could have had him killed after Takimura brought him in without trying to kill Takimura as well. Just come pick me up. I need to get to Misty Isadzerika. Run a VIX. Of course. A vehicle is en route. Delamain is an expensive AI taxi service. It's unlikely just because V wrote it one to the Arasaka job that he would come and pick them up for free of charge now. Precious tanking. It's neurogenic shock. He's dying. Gotta cut my way through the occipital bone. No other way. There is risk of I know what I'm doing. I also fail to see why after dropping V and Takimura off at Rick's, why Delamain would be giving medical advice to a Ripper doc. Did he drive his cab into the clinic? You don't have much time left. Much life. A few weeks tops. Silverhand's construct is overriding your consciousness, gradually taking over your body until one day you'll just be gone. A biochip that contains a personality construct that slowly takes over the host and turns him into the person on the chip is a pretty good idea for a cyberpunk story. After all, that idea has been mean tested by Altered Carbon, and V desperately searching for a way to survive on his limited time in a cyberpunk world mirrors Blade Runner's replicants a bit too much for my liking as well. I don't know how Misty got V back to his apartment in the mega building in a wheelchair. I've walked through it and it is not wheelchair friendly. Also, wouldn't V's apartment be the first place Arasaka would come looking for him? After the attack on the freeway, Arasaka makes no effort to find V or Takimura. Omega blockers. Taken regularly, they'll keep things from progressing too quickly. Also, they should keep that guest of yours calm and quiet. Pseudoendotrizines from me. Effect will be opposite. It'll speed things up. I suppose working off a series of novels kept CD Projekt Red from going overboard with references back in The Witcher. But now that they're backed by a tabletop role-playing game that just ripped off Neuromancer, the leash is off. I can feel it. Our minds touching. I'm like mold on fruit. Keanu Reeves is stuck in his best impression of Harrison Ford's opening narration from the original cut of Blade Runner. I don't think it's a controversial statement to say that Keanu Reeves is not an amazing actor. What he has is impressive stage presence, not to mention the uncanny ability to pick roles other actors turn down that end up becoming cult classics. But those were also leading roles where he got to be a man of action. Johnny spends most of his time leaning on walls inside V's peripheral vision and occasionally making insulting remarks on the conversation V is having with someone. If I wanted a teenage son who doesn't respect me, I don't think I would cast Keanu Keanu Reeves for the job. For the first act of the game, Night City was cordoned off by a police lockdown. After Saburo Arasaka is murdered, the lockdown is lifted, allowing a suspected murderer to travel to any part of the city he desires or leave it altogether. I can't count the number of times I'd be driving to an objective when I'd be interrupted by a text from someone trying to sell me a car. And the driving physics in the game are so piss poor, what makes you think I want to spend my hard-earned can collecting money on one when I start the game with a perfectly good motorcycle and car? It's not like your vehicle matters. The police don't chase you. Hell, no one chases you outside of scripted events. So buying something faster or sturdier will do you no good. 
The game also takes the open world approach of splattering icons all over the map in an unprepared first date sort of way, where they couldn't quite figure out a concise plan of action, so everything made the list. I'm still not sure why food vendors are listed. I can't recall ever needing to stop and get takeout. The only thing food does for you is give you some kind of buff and I'm not even sure how it affects you. The only icons that matter are side jobs and gigs, which are side jobs but with less effort put into making them. One of the first things I tried to do once given the option was replace my arms with mantis blades, because who wants a normal functioning pair of hands when you can have razor blades that ensure you will never be able to safely hug your loved ones ever again. Unfortunately, Ripper Docs wouldn't sell me a pair because I wasn't cool enough. How do you even determine how cool a person is when they walk into your questionable medical office? And how do you stay in business when only a small portion of the population are allowed to own your products? You are dying. You do not know how to save yourself. A chip, the relic, is a culprit. Technology made by Arasaka. Technology they alone know. This corporation can save you as easily as it can make you disappear. V wants to get Keanu out of his head, and I honestly can't blame him. Not because of the destroying his personality thing, but because I wouldn't want the guy my mom probably fantasizes about having sex with taking up residence in my body either. Zapper dumples and filth. In some ways, Night City never changes. Arasaka's still a despotic machine and the world's on a collision course with chaos. Keanu Reeves is such a blank slate of personality. I doubt you would even notice a difference if he completely overwrote your own. And it's not like V has much of a personality to override either. Takimura set up a back alley meeting with Hanako's bodyguard Oda, hoping to get a meeting with her to inform her what her brother Yorinobo did to their father. But Oda won't hear any of it. I can understand Oda being suspicious of V since he was there the night of the murder. But Takimura was Saburo's bodyguard. What's the story Yorinobu came up with to make Takimura a wanted man? Jackie, How's this please. all work? An algorithm pilots the doll's motor functions. It takes your profile data and transforms into experiences in real time. I see that brothels have adopted YouTube's market strategy. It makes a lot of sense, really, and explains why I feel like a cheap whore. Hi, I'm Sky, and you must be Vincent. Ugh, erotic customer service voice. If you gotta kill, kill. If you gotta burn it all to the ground, then let it burn. What part of V's profile led the AI to believe V is into violence encouragement ASMR? Evelyn's booth has an augmented reality display system in it that was used for investigating the attack that occurred when a netrunner fried the chip in her head while she was in doll mode, but that was weeks ago. And they never moved the investigation equipment out of the room or opened it back up for use despite not looking into it any further and having gotten rid of Evelyn. In fact, the bag inside the room says Night City Police Department on it, so this was a proper investigation. If NCPD had gotten involved, Evelyn wouldn't have been left in the care of clouds in her near catatonic state. At the very least, she was evidence of a crime. After Evelyn's brain implant was fried by the netrunner, her boss, Woodman, tried to have it repaired. When that failed, he turned to raping the catatonic woman before selling her to a sketchy ripper dock. Unless he got off on the sick thrill of it, why would the guy who runs a brothel where all the girls are AI-controlled and have no memory of their clients stoop to something so low? Especially when he knows that Evelyn has a brain dance implant that records whatever Evelyn experiences, meaning there would be evidence of his crime, and he sold her to the underworld where potential blackmail material like that would be exploited. Johnny isn't standing there in reality. He's inside V's head as a part of him. But that doesn't stop his digital ghost from picking up seats and moving them even though that's impossible. How many times do you think Johnny stabbed himself in the thigh with his elbow blades whenever he leaned forward in a seat like this back when he had a body? Got a problem with an implant. Not from around here. Couldn't find another ripper in the city to patch you up. Does Fingers instruct his thugs to turn away possible clients like this? With the cool system and all this, it's amazing that he gets so much business. Scum. Pathetic. A waste of words. I'm a hair away from putting you down. Two beefers from a BD studio took her. Didn't even know their names. Finger sold Evel into an underground brain dance group that produces snuff films. To find their studio where the brain dances are recorded, V gets his hands on one of their videos and uses the clues found on it to figure out the location. You'd think an illegal BD group would know that brain dances could be used in such a way. They were essentially selling interactive evidence of their crimes and hoping no one would find out. In the other brain dances Judy pulled from Evelyn after they rescue her were her dealings with the voodoo boys over the relic. First her meeting with Brigitte when they hired her to get inside Yorinobu's penthouse. Then when she overheard a call with Brigitte. Problem is, Brigitte only spoke in Haitian Creole while on the phone. So it's very unlikely that Evelyn understood they were talking about Johnny Silverhand and Alt. V gets in touch with the voodoo boys by letting them know he has something they want. He apparently expected them to be smart enough to pick up on the hint. Since when he arrives, Placidi does a scan of his hardware, even detecting the biochip, but still sends V on what was supposed to be a suicide mission to deal with a member of Netwatch operating out of the abandoned mall in Pacifica. Had it gone the way they intended, V would have dined with him, and they would never have gotten to look at the relic in V's head that is vitally important to them. 
We wish to contact Alt Cunningham. We know she and Silverhand were close. What's your plan to contact Alt? We try to cut out a unique piece of Silverhand's engram from the biochip. Alt will know it. If something of the human is left after years beyond the Black Wall, she will answer. In order to contact Alt Cunningham, who is beyond the Black Wall and the Deep Web, Brigitte needs to access a memory of her and Johnny's memory. So they pick the most voyeuristic and tragic memory Johnny has of Alt. The night after a concert in which they broke up and then Alt was kidnapped and her own mind ripped from her body by Soul Killer. That's hot, but that red wine is never coming out of that. I get the impression that CD Projekt Red feels they have to include gratuitous sex scenes these days. To be fair, they are the only developer who can do them well. Though in first person POV, it's kind of awkward. But when sex happens spontaneously with a character we barely get to know, we have a name for that. Porn. You can read Sonic fanfiction that puts more effort into developing the smut. Johnny can have sex without removing any of his clothes or even unzipping his jeans. I doubt he even needs to get erect. Cybernetic implants haven't advanced much in the 54 years since this occurred. The mantis blades this guy uses to stab Johnny from behind with are no different from the ones I slapped on V in the present. If Johnny is such a thorn in Arasaka's side, were I them, I would have had my guys finish him off after stabbing him through the stomach and taking his girlfriend. Would have been easy enough. Sit. Stay. I honestly believe Keanu read that line to a dog in the motion capture studio. In fact, most of his lines were probably him acting against a dog. Mr. Silverhand. You're coming with us. While Johnny meets with Rode to convince her to go with him to rescue Alt, Arasaka goons show up and try to abduct Johnny, something they could have done easily the other night. Johnny has a much higher health pull during this memory than during his final moments at Arasaka Tower earlier in the game, which canonically took place a few years after this. Long, boring story made short, Arasaka grabbed Alt to have her build Soul Killer for them. Johnny comes up with a plan to get her back by holding a rock concert outside of their HQ to cause a riot, then storms the place and accidentally kills Alt when he disconnects her body before her consciousness can return to it. Sometime after she died, Alt contacted Johnny to tell him that her consciousness was trapped on Arasaka's subnet, and that he should let her go and do nothing about it, which would have been accomplished by not contacting Johnny and letting him know that some part of her was still out there. Freeing Alt onto the net is what eventually got Johnny killed. How exactly did the Voodoo Boys learn that Alt had been turned into an AI and that Johnny freed her right before his own death and that his own personality had been put on a chip? Everyone assumed Johnny died when he nuked Arasaka Tower. The net is some kind of ethereal dimension in Cyberpunk 2077. It's been split into two sections, the old web and the new web, by the black wall. The old web is the hunting ground of rogue AI and a select few netrunners who have managed to cross over like Alt. And the new web is just your basic internet that has been separated from it. The old web has to be running on servers somewhere, and people must be paying to maintain them even though they can't be used for anything. Why can't Netwatch just shut down the servers running the old web to keep the new network safe instead of creating a massive firewall between the two? What can you do for me exactly? With the Soul Killer resident inside Mikoshi, I will create a construct of you, then disentangle your neural network from Johnny's. I shall then inject your engram back into your mortal form. V and Ald make a deal. V gets her inside Mikoshi, and she saves his life by separating his neural net from Johnny's and then re-downloading him into his own brain. Think of it like rolling back to an older release on GitHub. That should be all V needs to save his life, but he still has to go along with Takimura's plan to meet Hanako and look for Hellman, the guy who created the relic. I've declared war not because capitalism's a thorn in my side or out of nostalgia for an America gone by. This war's a people's war against a system that spiraled out of our control. I'm guessing Johnny was a Bernie bro back when he was alive. The search for Hellman begins with V having to pay out 15,000 eddies before he can continue the main quest line. It's a way for the game to redirect you towards side quests for a while. Previously, it did that by having Takimura say he would call you when he's ready for his next job. Decrypted map of upcoming Kang Tao convoy routes. Think Hellman might be in one of them? Thing is, which one? Take a look at the specs on this one. A lone AV, no ground support, no linked cargo manifests either. Rogue's information is detailed enough to know how and when Hellman will be moved out of the city by the Kang Tao, even the route they'll take, but not the location Hellman is currently at so V can try to get to him without having to figure out a way to bring down a military spec transport in the desert. Pan Am is introduced ass first. In order to get Pan Am to help him take down the transport that will be moving Hellman, V has to first help Pan Am get her stolen ride and cargo back from her old partner Nash. To do that, they set up an ambush in the ghost town where Rogue informed V that Pan Am's ride would be driving through. Her ambush consists of turning on the power so the main street lights come on. Then Pan Am instructs V to sneak up on the ship in the now fully lit street. If the plan was to do this quietly, why turn on the lights? Sabotage a corpo power station. Jump a corpo transport. Kidnap a corpo suit. Is this a plug for the word corpo, or do you have a point? Know what? You're starting to remind me of me. Fifty years back. Minus the charisma. An impressive cock. Cut me some slag, Johnny. I chose the biggest option the game gave to me. 
Pan Am's plan to bring down the transport is to create an electromagnetic pulse by sabotaging an orbital power station receiver the transport will fly over. Solar power satellites collect energy in orbit and beam it down to Earth as microwaves, otherwise known as electromagnetic radiation. There is no chance in hell that King Tao Transport would choose a flight path directly over it, let alone anywhere near it. Pan Am wouldn't need to trigger a pulse to bring the transport down. The beamed energy from space would do the trick on its own. The pulse plan fails to work, forcing Pan Am to go with Plan B, shooting the transport with a rocket launcher, which honestly should have been Plan A due to how much more straightforward it is. She never even mentioned this as an option. The biochip is what's unique, not Silverhand's engram. The previous version of the chip was only used to communicate with pre-saved engrams. And it was rare as fuck and cost a fortune. Yeah. This one's rarer. Meant to install and activate the engram in a new body. When I left Arisaka, the project was still in the trial phase. According to Hellman, the biochip in V is a prototype that was never meant to be released to the public. It was commissioned for Saburo Arasaka himself so he could live forever, downloading himself into a new body as he needed. The only question I have is why did they choose to use Johnny Silverhand as the engram for said prototype? He was a huge thorn in their company's side when he was alive, and a prototype has to be tested, so I assume eventually they were going to stick him in someone's head and revive Johnny as part of the test. Arasaka has engrams of a lot of people. They could have used any one of them instead of the one they chose. Things go to shit. We got a backup plan. What do you think? I am accused of betraying Arasaka. Soon I will try to confront the sister of the CEO in person. There are no backup plans. This one must work. Actually, there is a backup plan that Takimura uses once Hanako refuses to listen to him, which involves knocking her out, then somehow dragging her off the float in the middle of a parade without anyone noticing. Are you secure? Yeah, for now. There's no time to explain. We must meet. Where are you? An abandoned apartment block on Pine Street. How could Takimura have possibly already gotten Hanako to an abandoned apartment in a different part of town? The parade job just went down and V only just got into the elevator to leave the scene. Takimura was on a float in the middle of a parade hovering over the city with no transport to carry an unconscious woman. I was there that night at Kampeki Plaza. I saw Saburo Arasaka die. He wasn't poisoned. That's a lie your brother made up and spread. Yorinobu is the murderer. Which should have been fairly obvious due to the lack of any evidence of poisoning and the visible violence from Yorinobu's assault. Arasaka is suddenly good at tracking people down and flashbang the room. We must go different ways. Alone, we have a better chance. Takimura tells this to V while he's on the ground from a malfunctioning relic in his head. V might have a bit of trouble escaping on his own, you know. How'd you find me? Did you really think it would be enough to leave the city? Takamura mentioned he had placed a tracker on you. Yet even had he not, when Arasaka wishes to find someone, it finds them. Tell that to V, Evelyn, Takimura, and Hellman. All people Arasaka wanted found but never came close. Get up. Pacific's beautiful this time of day. You know, Johnny can't actually see things that V isn't looking at. I don't know how Johnny knows Pacifica is beautiful right now when V is on the balcony floor with a view of the cement. Gonna be there too? Not at this time. Arasaka is still searching for me. What did Hanako just say about Arasaka being able to find anyone they wanted to find? When a phone needed removal, my father ordered it without a thought to mercy. A way of being Yorinobu could not abide. This is the same Yorinobu who murdered his own father, then betrayed his father's bodyguard and tried to have him killed along with V to cover it all up. Just like at the beginning of the game, you have three endings to choose from that match up with the Nomad, Corpo, and Street Kid backgrounds. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, since all three are just a variation of the same thing. V fights his way through Arasaka, connects himself to Mikoshi, Alt uses Soul Killer on V to separate his consciousness from Johnny's, then drops a terminal diagnosis on his head of just six months due to the damage the chip wrought on him. I chose the Nomad ending, so that's the one I'm going to send, but it would be largely the same no matter which I picked. Tarot card readings have a 99% accuracy rating in video games. The Nomad's plan to get V inside Arasaka Tower involves attacking a maglift construction site and drilling a hole right under it. Fine enough, I guess. But why would a maglift tunnel dig site have a small army protecting it? How do you wreck a drill? It's a machine designed to go through everything in front of it. Adam Smasher is the final boss of the game, and what a waste he was. He was barely in the game to begin with. The only significant thing he did was capture Johnny over 50 years ago, and now he's a No Thrills final boss fight. After turning V into an engram, the plan was to download him back into his body now that he's separate from Johnny. But the DNA changes made to his body means he will die because his body is mostly Johnny now. I don't think your immune system can tell which consciousness is in charge of the mind, or would even care. But somehow it does and will treat V like a transplanted organ, and there is nothing that can be done about it. But I'm here thinking that if the biochip can turn V's body and mind into Johnny Silverhand, why can't it turn his body back using the same method? That's essentially what you're doing for his mind after all. 
AAA open world game just can't help themselves anymore. When it comes to ending their games with an overly long epilogue sequence, it fails to build on the more impactful ending it already had.